Welcome to the third episode in our series on spiritual growth. What is God's plan for the Christian life, even when things are difficult? His plan is for Christians to grow and develop spiritually, whatever the environment. We find an example in the letter of James. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When our faith is being tested, God's plan is for us to grow up spiritually and to become more steadfast, more committed to Christ. And that increasing commitment points us towards that what God's finished work will be like when we'll be complete in every sense. In what ways is the current lockdown testing your faith? That's a question that each one of us might answer in slightly different ways, depending on our experience. But the purpose of asking that question is to make sure you've actually recognised that your faith is being tested. When we're aware that our faith is being tested, it usually does provoke us to draw closer to the Lord, as we read in James chapter 1 and other Bible passages. For example, we'll spend more time reading God's word and praying. But I think the challenge of these current days is that we might not be aware that our faith is being tested. We've considered in a previous study how important it is for a church community to meet together regularly. It's in that situation that we can stir one another up to love and good works. And when we're practically reminded that as God's people, as God's family, we're not only accountable to the Lord, but also to each other. Now, usually when churches are stopped from holding meetings, it's because of persecution. But the reason for the current restrictions isn't persecution. It's so that this pandemic can be managed effectively and it's appropriate for those who govern us to give that kind of guidance. But because you aren't really being persecuted, you might think that your faith isn't really being tested. You've probably recognised that your physical health as well as your mental health are being tested, but perhaps not your faith. But the way you spend your time while experiencing so much isolation and potentially so little accountability will reveal something about how committed you are to Christ and how much you trust him. Like the situation Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, this is a time when the genuineness of your faith is being tested, just like gold tested in a fire to see how pure it is. That's one reason why we're doing this series, looking at what God tells us through his word that we're to continue in even while other things are being locked down. Today we're going to look at the letter to the Colossians, chapter 4, verse 2, and consider the importance that we're to give to prayer. In that verse, the Apostle Paul writes, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it, with thanksgiving. What phrases does Paul use in Colossians to express the importance of spiritual growth? Well, Paul describes his prayer for these believers in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And we see that one aim of his prayer is spiritual maturity. In verse 11, that these believers would be bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We find that aim again in Paul's statements in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where he instructs the church to be rooted and built up in Christ. That's a picture of stability, of being rooted, and maturity, of being built up. And in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, we're given a picture that's a bit like someone getting dressed first thing in the morning, but here they're putting on additional godly attributes. Paul has already listed things that they were to take off, to put to death in verses five to nine. And in verse 10, describes the new self as being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What does that renewal look like? 
it looks like us developing a godlier character and life. Here is a picture of a developing spiritual life where we are taking off some things and putting on others as we become more like Jesus Christ. Let's consider now the purpose of prayer and why it helps us to grow. What type of relationship do Christians have with God? In the second verse of the first chapter of Colossians, Paul describes the Christians as faithful brothers in Christ. They were a spiritual family. Then he writes, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The believers were spiritual siblings and their relationship with God was that of children with a heavenly father. It's no surprise then that when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray in Luke chapter 11, the first word in his example of prayer is Father. Why is prayer then an important part of our relationship with God? It's because communication is an important part of family life. God speaks to us primarily through his written word, the Bible. Paul points out the importance of the scriptures, what he calls here the word of Christ in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, where he writes, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But that's only one way communication, God speaking to us. How do we reply? Well, one of the main ways we reply is by prayer, by which I mean when we speak to God in response to what he has said and deliberately seek out his involvement in our lives by asking for his grace and his help. God speaks through, first through his word and thus informs our prayers. By starting with God's word rather than our own, we're able to have some understanding of how we should speak to our Heavenly Father and how he might answer. One author described prayer as part of living interaction. Our God lives, his word is a contemporary living word, and thus our reply in prayer is part of a living interaction with God. It's part of the communication that all meaningful relationships ought to have. Prayer is also an outcome of having God's spirit live within us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Having received the Holy Spirit, the confirmation of my adoption into God's family, the response of my heart should be to call out to my Father in heaven, rather than draw back from him. God speaks through his word, and one of the ways we can reply is through prayer. And that is why it helps us to grow spiritually, because it helps our relationship with God to develop. There are various elements of prayer, which we won't go to in, into in this study, such as petitions or supplications, our requests to God, intercession, when we pray on behalf of others, praise, our recognition of the greatness and glory of God, and thanksgiving, expressing our gratitude for God's grace in our lives. A nutritious prayer life that encourages our spiritual growth will have a mix of these ingredients. But let's consider now those first words of Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 about the practice of prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer. What was the practice of prayer from the very beginning of the New Testament church? Having seen Christ ascend into heaven, we're told in Acts chapter 1 that his followers returned to Jerusalem. Having gathered together in a room, what did they do? We read in Acts 1 verse 14, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. The picture regarding prayer is one of devotion, of commitment. These followers of Jesus were serious about prayer. Did this devotion to prayer carry over into the New Testament church that would soon begin to form after the coming of the Holy Spirit? Given that it's the spirit of adoption, it shouldn't surprise us to find these new believers calling out to their Heavenly Father in prayer. We read this description of the church community in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. And they devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So it wasn't just that group of first followers who gave importance to prayer. The first church was a community of people who were devoted to prayer. Prayer isn't just important for church leaders or a select group within a church. It's important for all believers. And we therefore go on to find it being given importance in many of the New Testament letters to churches. Churches are given instructions such as be constant in prayer, pray without ceasing, and in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And we could go on. Notice those words, though, used regarding prayer. Constant, without ceasing, in everything. New Testament churches were expected to take the practice of prayer seriously. And so, therefore, are we. How regularly should we set aside time for prayer? In Luke chapter 11, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And we have an indication of how regularly we should set aside time for prayer in the example that Jesus gives to them. We find it in the words, give us this day our daily bread. The clear implication is that we should set aside time for prayer at least once every day so we can ask for our daily needs to be met. We get the same indication in his last statement in verse 4. Lead us not into temptation. How often do you need God to keep you away from temptation? On a weekly basis? Monthly? Of course, the honest answer is every day. So we should deliberately set aside time every day to pray and seek for God's help. Recently, you might have noticed national and even international calls to join together in prayer. For example, the Christian Institute recently had a week of prayer. And it's great to join together as Christians to pray and to have our attention drawn to particular needs. But fundamentally, prayer isn't meant to be an event. Although looking through the Bible, that is sometimes what happens. Rather, it's mainly meant to be a daily exercise, part of the daily life of the Christian and therefore of the church community. What can make it difficult, though, to set, set aside time deliberately for prayer? The phrasing that Paul uses in Colossians implies that perseverance is required, that we'll need steadfastness and commitment in prayer. Otherwise, we'll be drawn away from this regular practice of prayer. So what makes prayer difficult? Well, there are lots of potential answers to this question, so here are just a few to think about. If we don't understand the purpose of prayer, we'll find it difficult. If we fail to see it as part of living interaction with a living God, if we treat prayer instead not as a reply to God, but just a request list, then we won't find it satisfying and we'll be reluctant to practice it regularly. As an illustration, do you ever get people cold calling you to try to sell you something? They attempt to create the impression of a relationship by using your name and saying a couple of nice things. But you know they just want something from you. And ultimately, neither of you are going to find that short conversation satisfying or productive. If you've fallen into the trap of treating God that way, then of course you'll find prayer dissatisfying and you'll struggle to pray. So remember, prayer is your reply to God. Let God speak first through his word to inspire your prayers. Reading the Bible and thinking about what you've read before you pray can therefore be a really helpful practice. Another reason we can find prayer difficult is simply because we get distracted. We're told in the gospels that Jesus himself would sometimes go off alone in order to pray so he wouldn't be distracted by other people. So think about when is a good time and what is a good location for you to set aside for deliberate daily prayer? Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter six about praying in secret and says that your father who sees in secret will reward you. But one last reason we might struggle to pray regularly is because we're not sure it makes a difference. 
We simply lack faith that God will answer in a meaningful way. If you're in that situation, then I suggest listening to the previous episode about the Bible, because the Bible and faith go hand in hand. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, if we want the faith to speak to God more, then we might first need to listen to God more, to become more aware of his promises and his character. Moving on, let's look at the scope of prayer. Paul writes, being watchful in it. How can we be watchful in our prayers? We find a similar phrase used in regards to prayer in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, where we're told to keep alert with all perseverance. That means we're to keep an eye out for situations that require an application of God's grace. Often those situations will be local. They'll directly involve people in the church, in our community, or those we're very close to. But looking in Colossians at chapter four, verses three and four, we can see the scope is meant to spread much further. Paul asks the church, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. He does the same in that sixth chapter of Ephesians, asking them to pray also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. The church was to pray for overseas mission, and we're to be watchful for the work of the gospel overseas. That's one of the reasons why those we support doing gospel work in other countries get mentioned regularly at our prayer meetings. So we're to be watchful in prayer. And finally, what's the outcome of prayer? Notice Paul adds those two words, with thanksgiving. What should we anticipate when we commit time to prayer, given Paul's instruction to give thanks. Well, firstly, Paul's call to give thanks is simply a responsibility of being watchful. Not only should we keep an eye out for those needing God's grace, we should also acknowledge those who've experienced God's grace and give thanks to the God who provided it. But secondly, Paul's recipe for prayer with thanksgiving on the ingredients list implies that we should anticipate God will respond to our prayers in a way that is ultimately for our good and for his glory and for that we should be grateful. We should anticipate he will keep his promise of Romans chapter 8 verse 28 that he will work all things together for good for those who love him. God won't always answer our prayers in the way we wanted him to. And that in itself is a reason for thanksgiving. What a disaster it would be if God just said yes to everything we asked him for. You can imagine the selfish path we take that kind of promise down. God does respond to prayer. He does answer us when we call for his help. But he knows better than we do, and his answers will be better than the ones we suggested. We can trust his authority in prayer because he is our heavenly father and he loves us. This is Peter's reasoning in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 7. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He will exalt us at the proper time. We might not be able to see his mercy now, but we'll see it with hindsight on the day of Christ's return, when he completes the work he started. We'll see how he worked it all together, the joys and the sorrows, to make sure that all of his people would get home. And so, whatever else we pray, we should offer the same prayer that Christ offered in the Garden of Gethsemane confident in his father's plan, confident of the glory and the joy that lay on the far side of the cross. Father, not my will, but yours be done. So let's remember to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Thank you for listening.